Thank you. Ten months ago, I was standing on a doorstep. It was dark, it was freezing cold, and it was a few days before polling day. I was talking to a lovely couple, one of whom broke down in tears. She was a nurse at our local hospital. She was stressed out, burnt out, and desperately needed more staff. So when I got elected, and Ed asked me to be health and social care spokesperson for the party, I knew I had my work cut out. Waiting lists skyrocketing, vacancies at record levels, many hospitals falling apart at the seams, and no solution to the long-running crisis in social care. And then COVID happened. In the face of a catastrophe that has cut across every aspect of our lives, we have watched Boris Johnson's government blunder through crisis after crisis, failure after failure. We are seeing the shocking impacts of isolation and bereavement on the mental health of people across the country, as well as the devastating physical toll of the virus. We have witnessed the failure to protect our frontline workers with adequate equipment. And more than six months into this crisis, we still do not have the promised world-beating test and trace system that Boris Johnson told us we could have months ago. As we head into a second wave, not only is this completely and utterly unacceptable, it is reckless. This government's incompetence is putting lives and livelihoods at risk. We need the government to fix things here and now to avoid the need for another national lockdown and to ensure that our NHS does not collapse this winter. But we also need ministers to accept that this is a moment for real change. The coronavirus has not just laid bare the fundamental problems facing our NHS and care sectors. It has exposed, in technicolour, the health inequalities facing the UK and has shown us why we need to rethink the way we see healthcare as a whole. We have seen the impact of poor and overcrowded housing, insecure employment and our broken welfare system on not just our physical health, but also on our mental health and well-being. For years, we heard stories of how, for example, if you lived in Chelsea, you would be expected to live on average nine years longer than, than someone from Blackpool. Somehow, health inequality has become normalised. But coronavirus has cruelly shone a spotlight on this scourge in our society. We have seen those health inequalities play out in real time, most shockingly in the disproportionate impact of COVID on people from, from black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, on people with disabilities and the poorest. When we think about the future, it's clear that going back to normal is not an option. It's time to reboot and rethink the way we live our lives and the government's role in helping us to do so in a more sustainable and healthier way. This is not just about how we care for our physical health, but how we ensure we support mental health and well-being too. Whilst we all want people to live longer lives, we want them to enjoy a good quality of life as long as possible. Health is wealth. As a country, we must decide that health can no longer just be about treatment. We need to prioritise prevention. We cannot just rely on the NHS to always pick up the pieces, especially not when people's lives and well-beings are shattered by the government's own policies like the failure to provide adequate housing, or to ensure children don't go hungry, or to keep people from tip tipping over a financial precipice. 
It simply makes no sense to have a welfare system which pushes people into poverty with knock-on health impacts and costs or to fail to tackle air pollution, which has such damaging health consequences. We need a society where housing, our education, the jobs we do and the air we breathe are helping keep us healthy. Not only do we need to reinstate the funding that was cut from public health budgets by the Conservatives, but we need a much more joined up approach to health. This means thinking about the health impact of decisions taken at every level of government, from local authorities to Whitehall departments. Liberal Democrats have long championed a public health approach. We already advocate a public health approach to serious violence. And we also know the public health benefits of excellent education, high quality housing, and environmental stewardship. It's about creating virtuous circles, not vicious cycles. This is why, as well as getting a grip on the immediate COVID crisis, I want to see Boris Johnson put public health at the top of his agenda in the long term. That starts with making someone at the cabinet table responsible. A, min a minister for well-being who will scrutinise the government's actions and ensure decisions are fundamentally in keeping with health and well-being. As well as this, in the same way that equality impact assessments pushed equality up the agenda, we need to in introduce well-being assessments to make sure new laws empower people to live healthier lives. Underpinning it all, as ever, we need a well-funded, well-resourced, resilient healthcare system to support our physical and mental health in normal times and in times of crisis. We still don't know what the future holds when it comes to COVID-19, but after the chaos and heartache we have endured this year, we should not have to fight to put health and well-being at the top of the agenda. It's what people expect. Okay, just hold there for a second, we'll just try and plug the mic in. Is it possible, sorry, to ask the guests just to turn their chair slightly further towards, uh, sorry, the interviewer, turn your chair anti-clockwise a little bit? Yeah, Tim, could the guests just turn the chair anti-clockwise a little bit? Oh, I don't know if he's the guest or the interviewer. Interviewer. Yeah. Just the interviewer. Face, face her a bit more. Just, just you a bit. No, the other way. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. A bit more. A bit more. A bit more. A bit more. Sorry, it's the first interview we've done. Andrea, going to the mid shot. Thank you very much. I'll give you the clearance in a second. We're just finishing lining up cameras for you.
Okay, yes. Hi, Mohsen. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you finding things? <laughs> yeah, okay. Pretty knackering. Full on. Intense. Are you looking forward to conference? Uh, I'm not overly enamoured with the virtual yeah. version, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm submitting one of the FPC motions on, I think, Saturday or Sunday. It'd be interesting to see just how well that works. Please make sure you get your speaker's card in. Yeah, yeah, I've done that. <laughs> oh, to, to you. To uh, you. Yours has gone in, I've just been talking. Or tomorrow, but yes. we'll, it sounds like we'll need to do another one for Saturday. Yes, because they need to go in by 4 p.m. the day before. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't realise. It's, it's all right. Uh, it was just it's my first conference as an MP okay. when I'm actually That's proposing fine. anything. So... Thank you, Manira. So there's been a lot of criticism of the government's handling of the pandemic. As our health spokesperson, your role has been to scrutinise the government's actions. What do you think are the three main areas that the government has gone wrong on? Goodness, Mason, where to start? <laughs> um, I mean, if I had to pick three, um, the first area I would talk about is messaging and communications. In any crisis, clear communication is key mm. but it's particularly critical in a public health crisis where what you say as a government can literally save lives um, and I think the government's messaging frankly hasn't been as clear as it should have been uh, I think perhaps early on when there was a, a, a much simpler message of staying at home mm. it was clear for a while but I think that was massively undermined by the Dominic Cummings scandal um, and then since then, as we've had to have more nuanced messaging, at times it's been contradictory. And frankly, now it's been even more undermined when you've got a government that wants to break international law, but is now putting laws in place that it's saying the public at large have to adhere to. So that would be my first area of messaging and communications. The second would be test and trace. WHO was saying back in January and February, test, 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 and test, trace, and isolate to try and suppress every case of the virus. The government stopped uh, routinely testing and tracing in March, and then it was too slow to realize that actually it needed to massively ramp up capacity. To its credit, it did start to ramp up testing capacity, but clearly hadn't planned for the autumn uh, surge of symptoms as a result of coughs and colds with returns to school. The testing system is in meltdown. I see this in my constituency inbox day in, day out. Uh, we had the observes, uh, absurd situation, which I raised uh, with Matt Hancock uh, in the Commons a couple of weeks ago, of you had to, people were gaming the system in my constituency and putting in an Aberdeen postcode and getting a test for an Aberdeen centre, but using the QR code at Twickenham to get a test. <laughs> and now schools are at risk of being shut because staff shortages and, and kids can't get to school because of symptoms and they can't get tests. Uh, and tracing, frankly, should have been led by local authorities, uh, public health teams from the start. And the centralised approach has just meant they haven't reached as many contacts as they need to. And the third area I would touch on is social care. And we saw the tragedy that has unfolded. I and my Liberal Democrat colleagues in the House of Lords, Sal Brinton and others, have been raising social care right from the start of the pandemic in terms of making sure uh, there's PPE on the front line and that they had access to testing. And then we've seen 25,000 people discharged without, potentially without tests, we don't know, into, into the social care sector. Uh, huge numbers of deaths and this idea that a protective ring was put around social care is a total misnomer frankly um, and yes they've started to take steps to put uh, safeguards in place now but we still know there's massive delays in getting tests back to care homes so that they would would be the three areas that I pick out uh, of a whole host of issues that yes. have gone wrong so you've mentioned the importance of a locally led mm. approach to coronavirus and healthcare more widely can you tell us a bit about why you think that's so important and what that looks like? Local authorities know their communities best and all the different groups and particularly the hard to reach groups. And we as Liberal Democrats, you know, it's in our DNA, grassroots activism, community activism. 
and we've got Liberal Democrat-led councils up and down the country who've been really doing us proud, starting with my own doorstep in uh, Richmond-upon-Thames, which is a Lib Dem administration, where government has failed time after time in so many areas. Lib Dem councils have been out there on the front line taking care of our communities and, and got helping guide them uh, and safeguard them through this pandemic. Um, a few examples that come to mind, I know, for example, in Portsmouth, the city councils worked in partnership with the university as well as the Department of Health and Social Care to put a walk-in test centre in place. Down in Taunton, there's been a huge amount of partnership working with the voluntary sector in terms of uh, supporting the homeless. Uh, in York, they've been providing mental health support to their frontline workers. Um, and beyond the COVID crisis, uh, in, in Lib Dem run Sutton, for instance, uh, in a cause that's close to my heart, which is children and young people's mental health, mm -hmm. uh, the council has worked in partnership with the NHS to make sure there's a counsellor in every school. So again, taking that preventative approach to health and well-being. Um, and I just want to say a huge thank you to our Liberal Democrat councillors around the country because I know they've been working incredibly hard against the odds and thank you for taking care of our communities. Yes, absolutely. So you've touched upon well-being impacts mm. and mental health. What are the examples of a well-being-led approach that works and why is now the time to push for that? Well, I'd start by saying that I don't think wealth should be the singular end goal for government. At the end of the day, you want a happy population um, and we want people to live longer lives, but a good quality of life too. Um, and so where I've seen actually in my own life a, a well-being led uh, approach has been in business actually, before I became an MP. I mean, I saw it in, in a big, big uh, global companies, but I've, I know of examples of smaller companies and other organizations that really focus on uh, work-life balance and employee well-being because they know a happy employee is a productive employee mm. and essentially that leads to a better bottom line when you've got a more happy and productive employee. And I think we need to n convert that into government policy at a national level. The challenge we have is that it's a so many governments are so focused on the short term, you know, we're, we're focused on a four or five year time frame because that's the length of a parliament. Mm -hmm. And this sort of preventative well-being agenda needs long term investment uh, in that you won't see the fruits for some years. So one example is, of course, New Zealand. Uh, where we've seen a massive investment in poverty reduction, uh, tackling uh, violence in the family, mental health initiatives. Uh, but it's early days yet to see the impact of that. But it's fantastic to see a government taking the lead um, on this. And the reason why I think now is the time we need to grasp the nettle is because the pandemic has really shown uh, the impact of, mm. on people's mental health and well-being. Uh, uh, at all at both ends of the affluent scale as it were so I see in my constituency surgery just last week I had a family come to me a family of five living in a one-bedroom flat where the father is an HGV driver now you can s first of all the mental health impacts of being in such overcrowded housing are obvious mm. there's also the physical impact of he's doing actually quite a dangerous job if he's sleep deprived um, so uh, and you've got uncertain employment, particularly for those on zero hours, contracts, etc. in the context of COVID. On the other end of the scale, I'm hearing from people who are pretty comfortably off, not in overcrowded housing, who've got high powered jobs that normally have them traveling around the world, not seeing their families because they're working long hours and commuting long distances, who've actually said, I've really enjoyed spending time with my family and I don't want to go back to the way it was before. So I think the public at large, where, wherever you, you sit in terms of the population, in terms of where you are with your work and your home situation, I think there will be a desire to do things differently. And I think we need to capture that and capitalise on that. Yes. And looking more forward, what do you think are the priorities in health and care in a post-COVID world? Gosh, again, there's many to pick from. Um, there's a few that come to mind, but the, the, the number one priority, which I think is a real burning platform, is social care reform. And I think it already was pre-COVID, and we saw Boris Johnson make grand promises on the steps of Downing Street. Uh, but the, the 
crisis in social care has been laid particularly bare through the pandemic, as I alluded to earlier. Um, but to fix it, to properly fix it, both in terms of the sh funding shortfall in the current system, but also to make sure that we have a, a, a more motivated, better paid, better treated workforce, and that you know, it's properly integrated with healthcare, I think it's gonna cost a lot of money. Mm. We're looking at in the order of easily 10 to 15 billion pounds is politically toxic. And therefore, I think it's imperative that we take a cross-party approach to it to try and develop a consensus so that whatever plan anyone comes up with is not shot down in flames. Uh, the second big area I'd pick on, which was, again, sort of a massive problem before the crisis is workforce. We already had huge shortages in both the NHS and, of course, in social care. I think that's only exacerbated by the pandemic as people are burnt out and there's already workforce attrition from, from what I'm hearing, talking to people on the front line. Um, and I very much hope that the this NHS visa uh, that the Home Office has, been, has put in place will be extended to social care workers as well. And that's something we've been campaigning for as Liberal Democrats in Parliament. Uh, the third area I'd pick on is the non COVID care backlog. We already had record waiting lists pre-pandemic. That's only got worse as a result of pausing almost everything for the sake of, of COVID. And we already hear stories in the press about individuals whose cancer symptoms are being picked up too late and therefore their prognosis is much worse and treatment is more difficult or delayed. Um, I had an example of, of a new mum with a newborn baby whose son needed a urology appointment. She was just offered a telephone consultation when quite clearly he almost certainly needed a scan mm. um, and, and to be seen. So uh, I, I, we need a proper plan from government on how, particularly as we go into a second wave and we'll see COVID admissions sadly go up, how we can continue to uh, tackle the non-COVID backlog. And the fourth... Uh, point I touch on is digital innovation and the NHS has been desperately trying to catch up with the rest of the world in terms of digital revolution and doing things online by dint of necessity over the last few months it's had to move very quickly in a way that it's never done before uh, to lots of technological solutions uh, that's great I'm hearing stories of people actually getting to see their GP within 24 hours through an online appointment or a telephone call whereas before it might have been a two three week let, uh, wait um, we need to find a way to hardwire, if you'll excuse the pun, hardwire that into the system and not lose that innovation yes. going forward. And you've touched upon social care. The government has yet again delayed their white paper on that. Yeah. Do you think it's something we will actually see in our parliament anytime soon? And do you think it's the time that we looked again at our own policy as Lib Dems on social care? Or is it something that can only be resolved on a cross-party basis? Well, as I said, I think the, the scale of the challenge is so enormous and so politically toxic, as we've seen in previous elections, um, that I think it has to be uh, tackled cross-party. Sadly, I've seen absolutely no attempt from the Conservatives to do that. Um, I was very disappointed to hear that it's been delayed yet again by the government. Uh, I hope and expect that it will come forward in this parliament, but maybe I'm, <laughs> my, my optimism is misplaced. Um, I think the scale of the funding challenge, though, is, is part of the problem when the government's obviously having to pump so much money into the economy um, with you know, huge unemployment facing us. Um, so I, th I, I would expect to see something. It might, might be next year, it might even be the year after, but I, I hope they will take a, a cross-party approach to it. I mean, if they're sensible, they ought to, because I'll want yes. to share the pain with all of us. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for speaking with me today, Munira. Great. Thank you.